Jenny. Hey, hey, hey. And on today's <laughs> show, we have a very special guest, two-time pre-nationals champion, Rory Linklater of BYU is kind enough to hop on with us. Rory, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. So second year in a row, uh, Victor at pre-nats, and second year in a row with an interesting celebration as you cross the line. You did the jersey pop in 2017. This year you did the bicep flex. What went into that decision this year? So the jersey pop last year was uh, a fail, as many know. Um, <laughs> what are you talking hot about? And humid in, hot and humid in Louisville, and I couldn't get my jersey as I was reaching for it, and so that that was a good laugh, uh, mostly for other people. But <laughs> this year, the flex is kind of uh, just, it, it was almost instinct as I crossed the line, but a lot of it has to do with just the little friendly rivalry between BYU and NAU. They didn't take well to my flex at regionals in the 10K outdoors, and so they now like to taunt me with a little bit of a flex chant when I run and they're spectating. So I believe it was Luis Grialba told me to flex at about five and a half K into the race. Uh, and I winked at him. And later when I crossed the line, I, uh, I, that was going through my head. And so I, I gave it a little two handed flex. So th this goes all the way back to, to track regionals. I, I don't remember this. What happened there? You, you flexed when you qualified in Sacramento and they didn't like it. Yeah, uh, I think it was uh, not received well. It, uh, like, would tell us about the origins of this BYU NAU rivalry. Like, is this obviously just because you guys are two of the best programs in cross country? Is it a heated rivalry? Like, do you guys talk smack to each other? What's that all about? I think running, there's no sense in talking a lot of smack because your legs do most of the talking. And, and so, as of right now, they're, they definitely have the leg up on us. Yeah. So, um, I mean, it just kind of is is what it is. You know, the media likes to play the BYU versus NAU thing. And so last year it was like, who's better going into the national meet? And then they kicked our trash. And <laughs> then track season, it was kind of like a little bit of, you know, they, they beat me, I beat them. And then they ended up getting the last laugh again. And it's just kind of this like, we're on similar levels and we race each other enough that it's become uh, a thought, you know? What's a bigger motivator for you guys, just looking at NAU as the top dog this season, or is it internally knowing that, like yourself and a couple other of the uh, top five guys, you, you guys are seniors, is it like more like, hey, this is our last chance, or is it let's get revenge on EA, NAU? Which one's mo motivating you more in 2018? I would say 2017, we were motivated highly by NAU. Um, this year, that focus has kind of shifted a little bit. I mean, at the end of the day, we know that they're our greatest competition. They're not the only competition. I don't want that to be the thing. Yeah. I definitely think Stanford has a really strong squad this year, as, long as, as well as Wisconsin and Portland. And Portland kind of snuck up on us last year, and they like to kind of play really quiet in the regular season. So we don't really know how good they are yet. Um, but anything can happen. And I think it's definitely internal for us just because we do have a couple seniors on this roster and because we we believe we are as good as we have been hyped in the past and we want to show that for ourselves and kind of put together a really strong performance this year at the NCAA meet. Roy, because of you mentioned off air the BYU's association uh, with the church, there is always seemingly a rotating cast of guys from guys either coming back from a mission or leaving for a mission, like obviously Casey Klinger, the top guy at Nationals last year, not currently on the team. I wanted to ask you, what 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 is it like to be a part of a team where athletes are continually like leaving and returning either from a mission or or um, coming back or leaving to one or coming back from one? What like what are the challenges, and then maybe what are the advantages as well? I think one of the advantages is we have kind of a next man up mentality when you have so many talented guys working together and such a strong team culture of like discipline and hard work. It's easy to um, kind of see one guy fall out and two guys rise in their place. And I feel like that's what happened with Klinger last year. You saw at the pre-national meet the kind of birth of Connor Mance and Clayson Shumway as athletes. Those guys weren't on the radar at all last year. Connor Mance was fresh off his mission in Ghana and was kind of uh, in the shadows 
and not really competing until indoor and outdoor where he had a pretty respectable season and he's come a long way even since then. And Clayson Shumway had a really rough cross country season last year because he went and worked on a fishing dock in Alaska instead of staying in Provo and training, but we kept him in Provo this time <laughs> and he's really fit and really strong and had a great outdoor track season in the steeplechase running really good marks and steeple and 5k and he's one of the grittier guys I know so we kind of lost Casey but we gained two guys that I think uh with the strength that they've acquired this last year fill in really well and I I believe our guys from last year's squad that are back have improved just based on time being on in the program and kind of experience yeah, and uh, speaking of Connor Mance, um, he ran a pretty gutsy race over there at pre-Nets. Um, what did you think when you saw him take off like that and just, like, plant himself in the lead? Yeah, so we kind of feed off each other and practice a lot in those harder workouts. He's kind of a guy that can really push pace uh, every day and seems to be relentless and more comfortable when he's uncomfortable for whatever reason. So I kind of knew that that was something that would happen here. We're kind of just starting to come into our element, uh, first real race. I thought he would definitely find himself up at the front, and it's not unheard of for him to push push a pace like that. And I think it's just in his nature to grind. He doesn't consider himself a strong kicker. I remember racing against him in high school, and he would have a 200-meter lead to 800 in the two-mile. So, I mean, this is a guy that always likes to front run. And I think that this will be really beneficial at the NCAA meet because as he's that aggressive, um, there won't be as much of a breakaway for him. I think that with the Alabama Kenyans and NAU's uh, strength of running up front, he'll have that same mentality of push, 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 but he'll be drafting off of guys that might be more established than he is and I think it'll set him up to run really really well yeah and you also mentioned uh, there's some really strong teams obviously in contention this year with uh, Wisconsin Portland NAU you guys um, what's it going to take for you guys to try to you know really pull off the win this season so in order for us to win and in order for anyone to win NCAA cross country you have to kind of have a special day and you have to set it up so that you're capable of having a special day Last year, you saw 2-3 finish for Baxter Day, uh, LeMong 8th, which was the surprise of the meet, I think. And then they had about an average day after that. Uh, Truard in the 30s, uh, Beamish finished right behind me in 40th. That's about where we expected those two guys to be. But with Day and Baxter and LeMong stepping up at such a high level, it made them pretty hard to beat on that day. Um, and so... I think that you need two or three guys to really, really have a good day and everyone else to just do their job as you would expect them to do in order to win. And I think the, the team that has the most guys, you know, kind of hit those home runs, not necessarily swinging for the fences, but just kind of dial it in on that day is the team that will come out on top. And I don't think that that's going to be, you know, NAU or us. I think it could be Portland. It could be Stanford and it could be Wisconsin seeing as Wisconsin probably has the favorite to win it all in Morgan McDonald. You guys have such a rotating cast of, of stars on your team. Lincoln here wrote a piece early in the year about how your second seven could probably qualify for the national championship meet. And even up front, like you were fifth on your team at Notre Dame, and then you go and you win uh, at pre -nats. Are your workouts, I'm curious, are they collaborative, competitive? I mean, how is it – what is it like to run on a team where – you have so many good people, but their place is not secured at all. So we kind of have a, a group of guys that, although it seems are rotating, we kind of have a hierarchy that has kind of been established with experience and with in workouts. We kind of know who's going to have a good day going into uh, a meet just because, you know, workouts kind of show what, what shape we're in. But we also pride ourselves on our ability to have a really tight spread and Notre Dame was an exception to that, that course. Uh, we kind of trained through that really hard that week. And that course, it has a really narrowing, uh, like you can't pass very well on it. Mm -hmm. So we ended up getting separated a little bit. And I saw myself get a terrible start at Notre Dame and never really connect with the group. But we like to run as a, uh, 
the you the word that Coach Iceone uses is a phalanga, which is like a phalanx, which <laughs> basically a, a, a pack all together and, you know, being able to reach out and grab your teammate at any given moment, you know, arm's length. And when you're in that position with, you know, a K to go, then yes, the finishing place can be very, very uh, varying because you don't know who's got the extra pop that day. And when you're training through the season like we are right now, it really is a matter of like who recovered best from the the week's workouts or last week's workouts. So I, uh, I feel like my mileage over the last few weeks has finally started to settle in and I'm starting to feel a little bit more fresh and, and have a little bit more pop in my steps. So that's why I was able to finish strong this week. One more before we get uh, some listener questions from Jenny. Go ahead. Yeah, Roy, I just, you know, you just ran it pre uh and Madison will be hosting nationals for, for the first time there in the Zimmer course. And you obviously have all that NCAA championship experience. Uh, do you have any sense about how the race will play out? Like how you expect nationals to play out? There are some parts that, that it gets a little narrow where it will obviously be crucial to be in good position. Do you think that the race will take out really, really hard uh, on the day, given the fact that the favorites in NAU are, are known for front running? How do you think that race will shape up in a month? Yeah, so that's the thing about national championships and all my experiences taught me is you really can't plan for anything. You have to plan for everything. And so I know the NAU's strength and Alabama, they love a fast first couple kilometers. Last year at Nationals, that kind of caught us off guard because we got out hard, and it was hard. And and I was in 30th, and I was like, dang, this is actually really, really hard. And we're really early in this race. And so I think the preparation is be ready for it to be hard early. Be ready for guys to be in front of you really early and you know try to compete with that. But also, the course itself in Wisconsin is very unforgiving, and I feel like uh, those hills will come back to bite you if you go too hard too early. So I think it's a, a, a course that needs to be paced properly, and I think that the weather could be a severe factor in November in Wisconsin, and I know that uh, depending on how that goes, it could really change the elements of the race. I mean, if there's a foot of snow on the ground, how much can you really push the first couple Ks? Um, and... You know, just with the hills, it kind of really forces a pack, as you saw at, in both races at Wisconsin pre-nationals and even the Nutty Comb meet. It just seems like it packs up really well because those hills are so unforgiving. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, we're going to switch it over to some listener questions now. So um, Mike S. wants to know, are you talking to past BYU legends like Josh Rodentinsky, Miles Batty, Jared Ward, and what kind of advice are they giving you? So I haven't spoken with Miles Batty or Josh Rotinsky about this season or all that much. I've met Miles Batty. He's a, a legend here at BYU. But Jared Ward is still really close to the program. He's technically listed as a volunteer assistant coach. Uh, he's always on campus because he's a professor here. I get to run with him quite a bit. Um, and... It's really nice having a guy like that around because no matter what shape he's in, he's always in good enough shape to push us. And so he <laughs> runs a few workouts with us. And when Jared Ward, you know, pulls you aside and tells you what he thinks, you know he means it. He's a very sincere person. And he has offered plenty of advice as far as, like, being patient and, you know, trusting the process, so to speak. And, you know, he adds a calm uh feeling to the team because he believes in us and he's so wise and experienced. And uh, Jared Lautenschlager wants to know, what's your favorite workout? Okay. Um, we actually <laughs> did one of my favorite cross-country workouts yesterday called Hobble Creek. It's where we drive out to a canyon just a couple miles south of campus and we run just like a steady state or sub-tempo effort up this canyon with some rolling hills. And I think that that plays into our strengths as we go into the Wisconsin meet where we know that it's a hilly course. We run a couple workouts here in Provo that have some pretty unforgiving hills and teach you how to stay in a rhythm. And Alex Klarner, he asks, how do you mentally prepare yourself before races, which is kind of appropriate considering you just got out of sports psychology. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I think developing a routine is big. Um, staying calm, making sure your focus is funneled throughout the season and throughout a, a, a race day. So, you know, knowing the circumstances and not, you know, thinking too much about what is to come and what has already happened and just staying in the present as much as you can. And I like to practice that in any way I can. I, I'm a big believer in like just attention to breathing, like kind of a mindful meditation approach, like before a race, just kind of breathe, stay in the moment and uh, be calm, cool and collected. Looks like we have another question. It's actually from one of our coworkers, Adam Ostrike. Um, he's got a really serious question for you here. Uh, your shampoo and conditioner game, what are you, what are you working with product wise and how big of a focus is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I don't even know the brand of shampoo I use. Um, it's unlabeled. I, like, I don't, gosh, it might be like a Target brand or wow. something. It's not necessarily the, the shampoo or conditioner. I like to embrace oh, the, product. the flow and the natural. Like, I only wash my hair like twice a week. Some people might think that's gross, but it's like <laughs> the natural oils add to the flow. Wow. And then J Jacob Gonzalez, uh, speaking of uh, appearance things, he asked, what's with the stash? But it seems like there's a number of guys on the team with mustaches. Any any story behind that? Yeah, so I think it's kind of an NCAA cross-country culture in a way. And uh, the stashies for Nashies. Right. I just have to work all season just to have a noticeable mustache. <laughs> and so it's kind of like a, a really early head start on that. Got it. And Got it. it's kind of just a fun thing. Like, we just we just joke, like, if we don't win nationals and you don't have a mustache, you're to blame. Like that's kind of like the team motto. <laughs> and uh, I hope those questions got you ready for this last final, very serious question. <laughs> Alex Abraham wants you to rank the berries, strawberry, blueberry, raspberry, and blackberry. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> but you didn't anticipate that one. one kind of. <laughs> number one, blackberry, number yeah. two, oh. strawberry, number three, raspberry, number four, uh, wait, what, what do I, does that mean? Blueberry. Strawberry? Blueberry. Yeah. Blueberry number four. Blueberry, blueberry number four. Yeah. 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 Yikes. Oh my gosh. Wow, I'm, that's I'm an with upset. You. I picked blackberries number one as well. He thought they were crunchy for some reason. So I don't know. I'm glad we're aligned. <laughs> blueberry. Bl I'm a big blackberry guy. Wow. I actually had some this morning. Oh, wow. I mean, that's, <laughs> we're talking about upsets in NCAA cross putting blueberry at number four <laughs> out of four. Is a yeah. Big that, that, that might be up there. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, Rory, thank you so much for your time <laughs> this morning, sticking yeah, with us with these questions. Uh, best of luck the rest of the season, and we will uh, we'll see you in Madison. Okay, we'll see you there. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. All right, thanks again to our guest, Rory Linklater, for hopping on there. You got the shampoo and conditioner question out of the way. You got the blueberry question out of the to. way. Uh, we got a little more insight, too, on the NAU-BYU flex rivalry. Very interesting stuff. <laughs> I did, didn't know that a uh, controversy had gone down at at regionals last, at prelims last year. So it's good to know a little little uh, little thing to keep an eye on the rest of the season. Yeah, and he, you know he was a little more happy with the fact that he went with the flex and said this season. But he also <laughs> mentioned that because he was wearing black arm warmers, you couldn't really see the definition of the biceps. That's okay. how he noticed that. He noted that on social media. <laughs> well, black's media. a slimming color. So, yep, exactly. Uh, that's really what he, that's exactly the, what he said. Show the guns I did off. not take that advice when wearing this shirt mm -hmm. today, by the way. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that yeah. would help. But, I mean, tons of fun. It's, it's really great to uh, see, see the personalities here in the sport. And they talk about the rivalry being blown up by – the media, a.k.a. us. <laughs> but then when you, when you have people chanting flex, flex, flex from the sideline, it's kind of telling me that there's a rivalry and, yeah. and they're more invested than anybody else, right? So right. It, it, it makes sense, you know, going back to, you know, high school level, like you always wanted to beat the team that was the next closest to you. You didn't need an outside person telling you, hey, you guys should beat them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Let's get to some other takeaways, though, from yeah. um, pre-Nats weekend. Lincoln, what was your, your pre-Nats headline? Other than the flex. You know, I had highlighted before the race in my men's preview that I thought the individual winner coming out of the Cardinal race would be the NCAA individual favorite. I, I realized after the fact Morgan McDonald was not in that race, but my takeaway, my headline, Grant Fisher now is the individual favorite, and we'll get a look at him winning there at pre -Nats last Saturday. Look at the guys he's running up against. We know two guys that were second and third at NCAAs last year in Baxter and Tyler Day. I thought it was telling when he told you, Kevin, uh, this is Grant Fisher, that he kind of mistimed his kick, maybe because he wasn't as sharp at this point in the season, or just he just mistimed it. But he still managed to get the get the win here over some studs, obviously, from Northern Arizona. 
Fisher, he's, he's been an NCAA champion on the track before. He, he's he's been in the top 10 several, you know, a couple times in, in NCAA cross country, fifth a year ago. I just, I, I think he's the NCAA favorite now. I know McDonald wasn't there, but knowing his, his finishing speed, which we're getting to look at here, and knowing the experience he had, this will be his fourth NCAA championships. I, I think this is his time, and this proved it on Saturday. Yeah, and um, actually after NCAAs uh, this past season at Outdoors, he kind of mentioned um, how he had to really kind of reevaluate where mm-hmm. he was at as a runner and his place on the team. His coach set him down, and um, you know, looks like he's decided that this is the kind of runner he wants to be, and he's a fire under him this season. Yeah. I think if it goes out slow, it definitely – favors him but I, I just don't see that chance of it going out so well I do know still to win in either and, and definitely you know last year like like Rory was mentioning NCAAs went out fast and Fisher chose not to go right. with that hard push at the beginning and he kind of regretted I mean he still finished fifth because he's he's an incredible runner but he kind of gave up a chance to win uh last year so the the thing will be will he do that if it goes out in 425 like will he will he go after that it'll be interesting to see but i i, I think he'll go after it this time and, and and he's uh he'll be a big favorite in my opinion to win my headline the rise of arkansas yeah in the women's race uh, which coincided with an oregon stumble a yep. bit uh, arkansas wins that women's race by 20 points over the Oregon Ducks. Now, Oregon, they had some good news in this meet. You see Jessica Hull there running to victory. That's a big boon for the Ducks to have another runner who's potentially in the top 10. But this is just a matter of colors here after that. Look at all the red yeah. that's going to come in from Arkansas before you see the next green. You see Katrina Robinson comes through there in second. But all totaled, I mean, the Razorbacks uh, had four in the top 10 here. Karina Villon ran really well. T- Taylor Werner. Um, I mean, they ran impressively, um, given the fact that they lost so much from their team last year. You can see already four Arkansas runners are in right now before Veronica Pizek comes in for Oregon in 12th. I mean, they lost, you know, Therese Heiss, Nikki Hiltz off their team from last year. Uh, We had them seventh going into the meet, and they vastly outperformed that. If you're Oregon and you see their kind of pack coming in, you have Hull who you can now count on and, and I think you can safely say, you know, she's a contender to be in the, you know, top ten, maybe even pushing a top five. Their two through five was close together, but it's just it's just too far back. So yeah. I guess the thinking is if you can keep that group together and then shave off a little bit of time, then you're in business. But I had thought potentially before the season started this was a team that could challenge for the for the for the win. You know, New, New Mexico um, and, and Colorado. I mean, don't count out Oregon. It's a good news, bad news type yeah. of a meet for them. With Hull, somebody who was 95th last year at Nationals, their final score, if she truly is this caliber now, a top 10 type of an athlete, and you get good days. In a, again, it's a month till Nationals. So if you get Pizek up at her top five level, Brower was a 15th placer a couple years ago. Baez is a – I mean, they still have these guns. And yep. if Hull's elevated and everybody else gets back – uh, they still have to like their chances, but Arkansas is certainly three in the top eight is nothing to joke with. And, you know, we didn't know what Katrina Robinson would bring, but right. obviously she's somebody that could on a really, really good day, maybe even contend for a national title. So our, the, the Razorbacks have to like what they've got too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Jenny. Yeah. So my top headline was BYU's death delivers, but misses big test against NAU and Portland. So that was what I was looking forward to most heading into pre-nats, obviously before we saw the entries, Mm -hmm. saw how the teams were split up between the three races. Um, And BYU dominated the white race. They went 1, 4, 5, 7, and 12, scored 29 points. Um, It was very fun to watch, especially Connor Mance's uh, antics in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, But (laughs) – you know, I really wanted to see how NAU's loaded crew would stack up against um, BYU especially. So mm-hmm. that was a little bit of a bummer for me. Did a good shot here of Rory storming on the outside. And, yeah, and, very and, exciting finish. That was BYU, guys. And we'll see the flex. Some names up there we didn't anticipate. We'll talk about some of them a bit later. But, I mean, Tipo Proctor there for, for UW in the purple there. Chris Ollie of San Francisco. You see Tooker of Stanford there on the right. But, yeah, I mean, BYU packing five in the top 12. And there is the flex right there with the arm warmers. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good flex. Yeah, la- he's right. Last year, I rewatched last year's. It's like he didn't know like where his shirt was when he was trying to grab it and like pop it. So he like I guess did, it like, makes this. a little more sense now that we got the insight that it was he was sweaty. Yeah, yeah. Was I mean he was yeah. he, he was definitely fumbling at it like he didn't know like oh this is a shirt. Like, right. It was because you see the people usually they go you know you grab from the sides right here and they just pop like that like 
I think he was like trying to go like across he, he, or something. He swiped and he missed. Yeah. And then he tried to go back and do both, and it yeah. was just like a weird thing. Yeah. I got yeah, to... a good choice to do that. He had a double purpose to go with the arm flex this year. So <laughs> message received maybe by NAU, although they had a pretty good race of their own. So. Yeah, for sure. Um, that rivalry. I think those two, if you're going to take anything away from the team race, those two just separated themselves from third a little bit more. No, We're not, you're not really going to count out you know, the other teams that he mentioned. Iowa State we didn't see. Portland didn't run an A team. Stanford's obviously yeah. good. But those two, I think, are a tier above the next group yeah. right now. Uh, under the radar performance. So – an athlete or a moment that we didn't see coming sure. that surprised us, Lincoln. Yeah, and I'm going to get back to the the men's white race there when we had the BYU guys. But Chris Ollie from San Francisco. I'm not afraid to say, even if somebody keeps his eyes heavily on men's cross country in the NCAA, who was Chris Ollie? I had yeah. really not heard of him before this meet. Uh, he did run at Nuttycomb where he got 38th place overall. Pretty respectable. But a third place here in the white race, uh, you know, Taking down a few of those BYU guys, including Mance, and just finishing behind Linkletter and then Aiden Tooker of Syracuse. Quite impressive for him that because that turned into a kicker's race. Mm -hmm. So if he uh, if he can kind of maintain his fitness or increase it and, and hold it over 10K, if it does come down to a hard, fast kick, because you really got to be – to finish well uh, at this NCAA meet that's going to be Madison coming up and uphill, you're going to have to be able to kick. The the, the non-kickers are going to struggle and lose a lot of places, and I think I saw a lot from Ollie. Interestingly enough, he did run the exact same time. Time doesn't matter in cross country. He ran the exact same time, though, that he ran at Nutty Comb. So kind of interesting to see huh. how the depth of those races may have changed, yeah. something like that. But Ollie, someone to keep on our radar going forward as a surprise, uh, a, a nice surprise there for the San Francisco men. I have another time doesn't matter in cross country, but sometimes it's cool. Yeah. Alicia oh, yeah. Monson at Nuttycomb, 1933.3. Wayne Kaladi at Prenats, 1933.3. Wow. What does it mean? Absolutely nothing. Yeah. I just thought it was cool. Or yeah. does it? Yeah. Well, sometimes when you're watching those races and you're not paying attention to the clock, you assume one race is way quicker than the other. I know yeah. the weather was different from one week to the next, but you'd have thought Prenats was way quicker because Kaladi – yeah, they and Kurgot and Lochetti were like pushing it. So it was surprising to me. I thought they were a lot more conservative at Nuttycomb. And even the difference between the two men's races, right? The yeah. the Cardinal one with NEU and Fisher seemed like way more tactical. But they ended up, I mean, I think I think uh, one was one in 23.48 and another was run at one in 23.53. So yeah, they were even, right there. Yeah. yeah. But like the Mance thing just made me see, it made yep. it seem like it was yeah. super fast. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, you're under the radar performance. Yeah. So for me, it was Aaron Templeton in the Cardinal race. So the Furman senior, he was up there with Baxter, Day, and Fisher. He finished right behind them in fourth. Um, he also took down Joe Klecker, um, Lawrence Kipketch, Peter Lamong, Alex Osberg, uh, Amon Kenboy. Um, and some scalps. Yeah, some scalps for sure. And to further put this into perspective, like you noted in your recap, um, he was 141st at the NCAA championships last year and 51st in 2015. Mm -hmm. So that really kind of puts us into, you know, a really radical perspective of just how much he's improved. Um, he looked really comfortable during the race as well. He looked like he belonged in that pack right alongside them. So, um, yeah, he definitely earned my under the radar performance of the weekend. He had Templeton had the fastest last split. I think it was was it five point six k was where the last timing mat yeah, was. Yeah, he, or something he like wasn't that. up in the pick. He wasn't up there the whole time. I mean, he had to work his yeah. way through the crowd, and you know maybe didn't get out of, as, as best of a start as those other guys. But uh, man, a big breakout for him. My under the radar performance. You had to dig deep into flow track to find <laughs> this one, but we, we the people who were there were privileged to this. Uh, Lincoln Shrike getting handshake <laughs> lessons. From the NAU men, he did an interview. Um, somehow, Luis Grijalva commandeered the camera. First rule of journalism, kids, never give up the camera. Lincoln did. Peter Lemong runs him through this tutorial. Uh, we talked with Rory Linklater about, you know, sometimes what you want to execute doesn't actually happen when it comes to celebrations. Yeah. This is exhibit A right here. Lincoln trying to come up with, you see a nice little Tyler Day there, face pop. I messed up that see, one. See that there. one? You fumbled there. Oh. Walk us through this, Lincoln. Well, he kept telling me to relax because apparently I was getting I was getting uh, a bit too, I don't know. My, too I was tight. You got too nervous. Too tight. Yeah. I just didn't know. And Got I also thought flow. I was being pranked the whole time, so I wasn't sure what was going on. I didn't know <laughs> if, like, who knows, like they were just filming my feet or something the whole time. But it, uh, I, I feel like I learned a lot about the Hand NAU tricks? guys 
Yeah, Peter you're, Lamont, you're a part thank of their you. culture now. I feel like it. Could um, you teach that handshake to somebody else? Not at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> it seemed very complicated. Tune I know in lo- later live. We'll do it on <laughs> Facebook. Cross country teams spend a lot of time with each other, so they're able to develop these ex- incredibly elaborate handshakes. Um, Being a baseball fan, I thought you'd be like into the whole like custom handshake thing. They right? are, but the fingers. I mean, I'm okay with like the slaps, but the fingers thing. Yeah, I, I don't some have good dexterity. Okay. Work there. Yeah, I'm all I'm used to is typing on a computer. I can't. <laughs> For I what it's worth, that was my favorite interview from the weekend. You, you're committed. You committed. <laughs> It did. It caught me off guard, but that's kind of NAU's calling card. They'll just catch you off guard with their hijinks. So, yeah, I learned a lot there in Madison. Big personalities in both the men's favorite teams. Yep. Pretty fun year. Yeah. Let's close out. Let's talk about Sadie McLaughlin signing with New Balance. We did a whole Facebook Live thing. Was that yesterday? Two days ago. Two days, days, yeah. News broke two days ago. And it's on the site, too, if you want to watch it. Time flies. We talked for 19 minutes about it. Uh, You can see the shot there. She was in Times Square and did the announcement, the rollout. Sid, Times, Sid New Balance. Lights. Kevin, I want to talk about your takeaway, how you were talking to me the other day in the office about how it's um, incredible that she's in, what, is that the, the biggest city in the United States or the second biggest city in the United States? It's the biggest city, it's the United biggest city by far. Well, I don't just comparing it to Los Angeles. I don't know my... You, I, I mean, by population, it's bigger. Geography. Okay. No. There we go. Okay. okay, so we got that nailed down. <laughs> but the fact that she did this photo shoot at 41st and Broadway, yes. and nobody with a camera phone sat there and knew, you know, said, Sidney McLaughlin is signed with New Balance. They got a big... I think that's photoshopped I mean, in the back. I mean, it's but, New York though no one cares i guess i well okay so look at the woman let's put the could we put the picture up one more time i mean look at the woman you know or the people in the red jacket there's there's people around yeah all it would have taken like one of them had to be sort of like tangentially a track fan and, and then they could have texted <laughs> it out hey do you know who this woman is i'm seeing her in times yeah. square well what they did was crew. they actually walked around times square and had everyone fill out non-disclosure agreements ahead of time extensive. That, that's it's not, not okay, true okay i was gonna say, I, I, okay. I, lied. I was gonna say no i just contrasted it to remember lebron james not the first decision but the third decision this past decision when he decided oh, to go yeah. to the lakers and everyone was like charting like where his kids were enrolled in school. And then he went <laughs> to like Antigua and they had the thing called the Decision Cave where oh, he was yeah. plotting where he was going to go next. Track and field. We walk right in the most populated yeah. place in the United States, <laughs> literally put it on a billboard and nobody knows. No. But, but Well, we don't know that. That We only know what they filmed. Yeah. Sure. But I mean, she's in Times Square, right? I mean, I I, I don't know New York. Well, geography. what I was saying earlier about, you know, they don't care. It's, it's just like the New Yorker attitude. They're like, I'm walking here. Oh, you know, I see, they're I just see. head down trying Jeez, to get How place many people to place. are we going to offend on? <laughs> no, no. Definitely Amy Stepman, <laughs> who's from Yonkers. For, 41st and Broadway, uh, smack dab in the middle yeah. of, of, of Times Square, though. But uh, yeah, congrats to Sydney. That decision is now behind her. New Balance, it is. Yeah, we're going to be seeing a ton of her and, and New Balance in the future. Exciting times for track and field. Now she's a professional. It's uh, it's going to be fun to watch her compete in the Olympics. Maybe maybe she makes it all the way to 2028 in Los Angeles, and she's still the face of, of New Balance and the United States track and field. It's fun to think about. Oh, yeah, I think she's – you can you can sketch her down for you can write her down for three Olympic games. Right yeah, now. for sure. Yeah, 20, for sure. 24, 28. And another thing I kind of forgot to mention um, when we did our show the other day, um, breaking this decision down, um, what this is going to do for the women's 400 meter hurdles. So as a former 400 meter hurdler, what is this going to do for excited. them? Let me hear this. Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's going to bring a lot more attention back to that event. Um, you know, it's an event that didn't really have any like really big celebrity faces to really pin on it. And, sure. Um, so yeah, I think this is going to bring a lot of attention to it. Hopefully it's going to lead to, um, more interest from people participating in it at the lower mm. levels. Going to build it back up. It's going to be a marquee event. I'm excited. You're going to see. You're going to see like a Sydney bump, like in, yeah. in graphs and stuff in history. It's like, why did all it's of a sudden the Sydney people... McLaughlin effect? Yeah. Why did like 2018 a huge spike <laughs> in participation? If, if Dalia Muhammad and Corey Carter are watching right now, they're they're using the uh, the this this emoji <laughs> right now because they're like, wait a second. Oh no, been, no, I got I got mad love for them. No, yeah. but this is this is a bit of a different um, oh, for situation sure. just yeah. because she was an Olympic qualifier as a 16 year old. So sure. yeah. that's something. You know, that's what was the last time that happened? It was like well, 40 some years ago that that even happened. Well, she might be to this event what Edwin Moses was to the men's 400 right. hurdles. He created a name that everybody associated with that event. And Definitely. even people who weren't diehard track exactly. and field exactly. fans associated Moses with the 400 hurdles. And I, I didn't thought of that from that perspective, but I think that's. That's true. Do you think yep. she he she breaks his streak of amount of races won in a row? No, that that is. <laughs> a, I don't know if that that's like not humanly possible. Like you look yeah. at that number, it's crazy. But I do think, and Jenny and I agree on this one. I mean, I, th- I think the world record's gone. Yes, next it's gone. year, um, and then that'll increase the increase the the Sydney effect even yep. more. Mm-hmm. Yep. Don't know where she goes from there in terms of event, but watch the full 19 minute breakdown, and you can see. <laughs> yeah. 
all the thoughts and all its glory. Um, anything else, guys? Did we miss anything? I feel like we covered it all this week. I think week. we did. We hit, it, hit all the points. Yeah, next week on the show, we'll preview the big conference matchups that are going to be happening in NCAA Cross because, of course, we'll be live at Big Tens, Mountain West, and Big Twelves. Got it all covered. Which will be a ton of fun. So You'll be at Big Tens? I'll be at Big Ten and, and Big and Twelve. Big 12. Woo, the only place the I bigs. won't be is the place with the awesome weather. Yeah, Mountain West, which is in. So yeah, San they're going to be road tripping along with Travis. Yes, Travis, uh, Adam O will be there. Yep. It'll be it'll be good times. I'm um, looking forward to freezing again. In the Midwest, <laughs> it's my. Bi- as long as you can hold the mic steady this bi- time. Hey, I did a better job this week, you guys. Did. Everybody, <laughs> Travis in particular, blasted me on social media when I do it wrong. <laughs> but when I do it right, there's no like, man, look at the poise with which Kevin yep. held. This mic. Lincoln was doing some interviews, too, so I felt pressure. Like, he did it well. My teeth were chattering. But was he, or was he just palling around with NAU? He was just – he was actually doing that to keep his hand warm. Yeah, I was just eating snacks in their tent the whole time. Uh. All right. Thanks again to our guest, Rory Linklater. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We will talk to you guys next week. Bye-bye.